an excerpt from Rolling the Bones, A Fiendish Guide to All Manner of Mortal Games of Chance, by Balzafon, Duke of Bator, and Legate of the Legion of Mortal Sabotage, Army of the Nine Hells. The Princess The Princess is the fair card with a value of four, placing it between the Fool and the Priest, with the Peer of the Spy on the foul side. Its rather low value means that assembling a victorious flight containing the princess can be difficult, though its effect upon being played is almost certain to trigger. That effect is potent. The princess causes the effects of any dragons in its flight to trigger for a second time as though they had just been played with advantage. However, we see yet again the ingenious contradictions woven into this game by its devious creator, whoever that may have been, because the best flights containing the princess would be composed entirely of mortals, so that tension is woven deeply into the card's utility. The princess will only rarely be useful in a straight, but makes a potent addition to any flight with a pair or better of high-value dragons. The Priest the priest is the fair card with a value of five, placing it between the princess and the druid, with a peer of the adventurer on the foul side. Its comparatively low value means that assembling a victorious flight containing the priest can be difficult, though its effect upon being played is quite likely to trigger. That effect is subtle, but potentially dramatic if exploited carefully. It makes the player who showed it the leader of the next round played, regardless of the outcome of that round's ante. This can potentially disrupt the anti-strategies of some or all of the other players, and ensures that you will be able to realize the effect of the next card you play, regardless of that card's value. This effect holds even if played during the last round of a gambit. You will automatically lead the first round of the next one, so long as play continues. Laying the priest, followed by the Archmage, is both a potent strategy and a strong signal of the highest mortal inside straight. Either a clear warning, or an obvious bluff. The Druid The Druid is the fair card with the value of six, placing it between the priest and the thief, with the peer of the Emperor on the foul side. Its value is not so low as some other cards, but still low enough that its effect can be expected to trigger in most rounds, even when played last. The effect of the druid is to radically alter the terms of play. The hierarchy of value of all flights is reversed for this gambit, such that now the weakest flight wins. This can make the druid a devastating play in the final round. <laughs> In the city of Greyhawk, five individuals are united by circumstance. A brewer priest, a haunted swordsman, a living relic, a caustic criminal, and a golem without a past. With the drawing of a single card, their lives have been turned upside down. Welcome to the Chimera, a role-playing adventure podcast. Our campaign this season is called Misplaced. It takes place in the venerable setting of Greyhawk, kind of and we're playing with a modified version of 4th edition Dungeons & Dragons. I'm Vin LeBate, and I play Golden Eye Rakashi, a dragonborn rogue. Joining me today are... I'm Braden Lamb, and I'm playing Balmo, a halfling cleric. I'm Jeffrey Bard, and I play Sir Simeon, the human sword mage. I'm Josh Hallbachner, and I play Ashlar, a warforged sorcerer. I'm Casey Smith, and I play Latchkey, a shardmine with the dual classes of Battlemind and Scion. And I'm Kelly Weissman Aspruth Jackson, the Dungeon Master. Now let's get started. So the party, after a at long last, has been reassembled. Rikashi has rejoined the others, and everyone is now inside the cube. Inside the cube, you are in a room with no ambient noise and no ambient smells, but with a very strong, slightly off, bright white light coming from the entire ceiling overhead. This room, as a reminder, you chose to make transparent in the floor and in the walls so that you can see 
how the cube itself is hanging over the space underneath it that has been partially excavated by the goblins in the Scarlet Brotherhood. The cube is turning, which makes the motion, uh, the, the, sort of the view around those, through the floor and through the, the transparent walls, a little bit jarring. While the floor is transparent, the platforms set into the floor, or rather on top of the floor, are not. So there are a total of 10 smallish white platforms around the outer edge of the room, sort of in a ring, and then one large platform in the middle of the room. That's where Rikashi has appeared. The rest of the party, including, from Rikashi's point of view, uh, Demirtha, whom Rikashi knows, uh, a floating, many-armed, metallic creature that would be unfamiliar to her, and a dog for some reason, <laughs> are all standing a little bit to the south, or, I mean, what is south when the cube is spinning, but a little bit away from the large central platform. It's your game, folks. The abyss, you say? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, I'm gonna need for us to take a time out. What the fuck are you standing on? Oh, we're we're all in the cube. No, that's not an answer to the question that I just asked at all. I think you'll find it is. <laughs> this is the princess. It is one of the stations of the Chimera Project. Obviously. No, 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 no. <laughs> Look down. <laughs> As a reminder again, the floor is transparent at the moment. Mm -hmm. I lean down and I knock on it with one hand. There's a, a, a soft but audible clanking noise. Okay. I'm going to buy that based on all the other shit that's going on. Uh, Rikashi, the way that you are facing, you can see the large image of the princess card, Callista's princess card that's set into the wall at a height above the doors. Oh, the doors also are visible in the walls so that, that those parts aren't transparent. Again, it looks sort of like the um, door in and out of the holodeck on Star Trek The Next Generation does. Um, so that picture of Callista is also visible and not transparent and probably at least a little bit surprising. Rikashi, okay. I yeah. am so glad you're alive. And I'm so glad... You made it here with us. There's a but long, you can trust the ground. This is all very weird in here. There's a long pause where she sort of processes that. Thank you. <laughs> hey, uh, princess, uh, let's make the floor not invisible again, okay? The floor becomes the same plain white surface that it was before. The walls don't change. Oh, and the walls too, please. Oh, wait a minute. Princess and the walls, too. <laughs> that is exactly what Bamo says. The walls go back to the same plain white surface again. So now you're in the more familiar to some of you, even more weird and off-putting, perhaps, to Rikashi, uh, plain white space with uh, very little adornment or detail. Okay, this, this is not exactly what I expected. And I have no idea how this influences the plans that we didn't have, but probably should have. There are plans? Well, so here's the thing, is that when I was out on the island, I ran into a master chef, and he says that something about us being here is uh, part of some sort of end of the world thing, and that we should leave in order to prevent the end of the world thing. Um, uh oh, he, I have, I have not yet done it. <laughs> I can't guarantee that I won't, but, uh, we, we found some stuff here. Okay. Um, you haven't done anything dumb with ashes rock, right? We put it in the closet. I can't tell if that's dumb or not. None of this makes any fucking sense. Okay. So let's. Let me do, let me tell you the things that I remember in the order in which I remember them. So there's a thing about how, for some reason, we're all brought here to bring about the end of the world. 
Darvin Tolrick, the master chef, the Balmo knows Darvin Tolrick. Oh yeah. You guys probably have heard of him. He's, he's fairly famous. Um, and who is assigned here as part of a drow thing. Um, he seems to believe that the obelisk is the key to activating some sort of device that will make all of the end of the world shit worse. So on the one hand, I guess in the closet sounds like a safe place, but I also don't have any idea what the thing that it goes in looks like. So if this is the thing, then it's done and we're dead. Um, Did Torek tell you anything useful? Uh, yeah, sorta. So first he gave me directions on how to get out of here through the house of black lanterns. And then when he found out the cube was spinning, he said, you don't have enough time to do that. You have to go to far shore and get out through there. Uh, and generally we have to get, Oh, and we're in the abyss now, as I mentioned, because, okay. You know, those tower things, the tower things, we saw the tower when we came in. I recall. So those aren't like, we're moving between those mm. essentially. So that tower was where we were when we got here and the tower that we're at now, wherever that tower is on this Island somewhere, presumably we could be by that tower. If we went to wherever that tower is, is a tower that is in the abyss. So where were we in the middle? In, um, let me, let me lay out my thought process here. I'm assuming that if there is a network of towers placed throughout time and space, which I believe is what we've been told, that the Chimera Project can move through. Okay, no one said anything about time. I am not... Uh, yeah. Some of us are in possession of cube-based knowledge. <laughs> okay. I'm just going to pretend you didn't say time. Keep going. If these towers are placed throughout various dimensions and axes, and this archipelago is moving through some magical process between them. It was placed in a location where we would not have expected it to be when we were originally traveling on the ship. That seems like a reasonable expectation, right? I thought we were placed in a place we didn't expect to be. I Because, okay. Possibly both. Now I'm going to have to go back to time because we went from night to day. Right. So we definitely skipped something to end up where the island was at its tower location. So no, I have no idea where that first tower is, was, and how we got from where we were to where it is, was. But but we can assume that we moved from somewhere in the ocean south of Greyhawk mm -hmm. to somewhere else. Yes. And then now moved again to the abyss. Yes, and I think we Tolik must have... did not tell you where the second place was? If he did, I've already forgotten it. Um, <sighs> and we've also moved one since then, because when we got here, there was the tower, and then the tower went away, which means we moved away from the tower to a second tower. Is that when the, where it changed from day to night? No, it well, changed no. when we moved. It changed on the ship. Yeah. It changed, it changed right. just after the ship crashed. Just after. Um, or ju just after the ship crashed. Uh, there was no noticeable change in the sky when that happened except for the fact that it was day and not stormy no, no, the no, weather the changed moved. but oh, but, okay. but there wasn't the time of day did not apparently change so the reason that it went from dark to light was that it was no longer storming not that it was night and now it was day that is yes a reasonable conclusion to draw with the facts in it sorry yes. um let me clarify this for myself it was night when we were on the ship and then it was day when the ship crashed because there was some kind of skip. And then when the tower moved, it was still day. Is that what we're saying? That's what I'm saying. So we did have a night to day skip. Mm -hmm. You did. But that occurred when you were on the ship. Yes. Had nothing to do with a tower moving as far as we know. Hmm. Okay. Also, I'm really sorry that this isn't like a last airbender style animated series, because if it were, some of us have cube-based knowledge would definitely be a gif. <laughs> Tumblr, Tumblr would be all about that. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so okay. that sort of plays into our instructions because we were originally supposed to go to the House of Black Lanterns and wait there until we moved 
to the tower that's kind of over by there, which would be our cue to figure out how to get the fuck out from the House of Black Lanterns. But any who well, anyone who wants to be curious about what the House of Black Lanterns is can make a history or arcana check. I will do that. Uh, Rakashi is assuming that because she knows about it, everyone else must know about it. Do I dare? <laughs> always, always. Oh, do it. Well, it's only history or arcana. Religion, no. Oh. So I think you're safe. Oh, like, like, that's going to stop you. <laughs> right. <laughs> Uh, I am trained in history, so I'll, I'm, I'm almost gonna comb through his, uh, his knowledge, his half-remembered knowledge. Uh, okay, not bad. Uh, 19. 19? Anybody else? 27. Jesus. Uh, Better. Actually, it makes a lot of sense for Ash to know this. Mm-hmm. <laughs> 26. Jeff? 23, sorry. Okay. Um... So I want to explain my thought process on this because Brayden has the lowest role, mm-hmm. but he's also a specialist in the hospitality industry. <laughs> so right. arguably he has the best reason to know about this place, which means something funny has to happen. So oh, it, did, it did actually just put me over to 20. Oh, OK. Not, not 19. Okay, well, twenty was the threshold, but never mind. We're, we're all every, everybody knows about. It. So everybody has made their role uh, and meets the meets the threshold. So it's fine. Uh, just to make sure that the players know, uh, the House of Black Lanterns is a possibly mythical, possibly real sort of floating in at the crossroads type place that appears in different locations at different times. It's supposed to be both a rooming house and a tavern and a casino. And there are stories about how you can go there and wager bizarre things like 10 years of your life or um, win inscrutable things like (laughs) getting back memories of a life you didn't live before, that kind of stuff. So it's a it's kind of a magical casino, magical hotel. um, Oh, I see Jeff pondering. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, I'm heavily rooting for a side game where we play the staff of the end of Black Lanterns, (laughs) the House of Black Lanterns. That sounds like fun. So, Darvin Torek wants us to go there. Well, no, he wants us to not go there anymore because we were too slow. Er. Um, No, I think it was actually because you idiots were too fast. (laughs) But wait, the world is going to end? But yes, the world is going to end. So hang on, hang on, hang on. The the, The stone is not supposed to be in the cube? Where's the stone not supposed to be? Anywhere but this fucking island, apparently. So here in the cube, I don't think we're actually on the island. I think this doesn't count. So I don't necessarily have a problem with that. I'm not. Okay. Again, I'm the only one here who isn't a wizard. So I really have no way of telling how close the idiots downstairs are to breaking into this. Mm, Hmm. Not very. Yeah, we have no evidence to suggest that they have any ability to do so. The cube starts to rock and crash. Like there's like something to be hit it from the outside, maybe. Uh, it shakes violently. So hang on, hang on. Sure. Let me ask uh, from a character perspective. We've never felt it move, right? Like it, it always kind of felt. No. Okay. Right. What? And we turned off the the transparency. Yes. Princess, can we see what's going on outside again, please? The floor and the uh, walls become transparent again. And you can see that things are sort of uh, where you left them down below, but the um, the goblinoids and the humans have assembled. Uh, looking down, you can see that um, they're sort of in the general vicinity of the um, the big platform there that you're hovering over. And it's sort of hard because the angles, right? Because the platform... Directly below the platform, or directly over the platform, is where the non-invisible platform that Rakashi is standing on is. But if you sort of move around a little bit, look at things slanty, you can see that on the platform outside, the one that is equipped, the transportation platform essentially is equivalent to the one in the room here, the, um, the human with the goggles, who you know is named Raihar Tretpo because you got all the names of the humans um, from Yibda. Mm-hmm. Uh, is standing on the platform and jumping up and punching the cube. (laughs) 
Hmm. That conforms to when it shakes. Now, how much does it, like, like how much of a shake is this? Hmm. It's uh, certainly not more than moderate. Um, like, like not enough to do Star Trek Bridge. Moderate's a lot. Uh, no, no you're, it's a cut above. It's a cut above the, the the Star Trek Bridge shaking. It's not like you're being hit by a photon torpedo. It's it's like uh, like choppy water on the open ocean. Princess, is this shaking something that we should be concerned about? The princess is being struck from the outside. There is no particular threat of damage to the princess. Hey, sorry, this thing talks. Thank you, princess. It's a princess. Yes, this is the princess. You can ask it lots of questions. It's very polite. It answers to the princess and only the princess, but oddly not your highness. Great. Uh, But the shaking does also worry me because there's a big glowing thing elsewhere in this uh in this place that's already kind of damaged and mm-hmm. i'm a little worried it might get more damaged if it gets too shaken up so just let me double check so where approximately were we in terms of bleeding off um the scarlet brotherhood camp because the in the last episode because because we we'd had whatever initial population they had and then the losses that they took from Rakashi picking them off and then we sent a giant monster to go beat them up yes and I actually did a census of remaining goblinoids I put it in the slack this was several weeks ago now Mm -hmm. I think there were something like so there's the three humans they have one bodyguards like named goblinoid each there's the bar guest commander, so that's seven. And I think it was like, I want to say 15 or so more foot soldiers. So we've, we've, we've taken them down to about half of what they had when we arrived, I guess. Uh, it's roughly, yes. I mean, if you're only counting quantity and not quality. Yes, quantity of, of alive. Yep. Yes. Well, we say... If this one wants to come in here this badly, let's let him. Yeah. What do you think, Rikashi? Uh, what's your uh, reconnaissance told you? Do you think we as a group could take uh, take on Jack B. Nimble out there? Yeah. I I don't... Could any one of us make this cube shake like that? Like, that's kind of a thing. Like, I didn't... I don't think I had respect for these guys before until this point right now. Um, I had that same experience outside. We don't need to kill him. All we need to do is get him into one of the holding cells. Hmm. Yeah, but he's probably not going to chase a rabbit. (laughs) But he would chase us. Oh. I'm trying to remember what the... When we were talking to the princess, she said that we couldn't transport anybody directly between rooms unless, unless they were in one of those predetermined cells. Correct? So we would have to get them to to get into one of those cells. Mm, a challenge. What color is Latchkey right now? I was just going to ask that. Oh, red, and he looks extremely gleeful at this entire idea. Yeah, <laughs> that seemed like a red yeah. statement. Yeah, nothing, nothing suggested that they changed back after they turned to red. Mm. No, they, they stayed red. We have cube knowledge and red attitude. So how how high is this guy jumping? Uh, so like 100 feet. Yeah, roughly. How how long does transporting take? Uh, something less. It, it, it's not so instantaneous that you don't like see that something is happening, but it's a, a matter of a second or two. Uh, okay, here's here's my latest proposal. I think we determined that there were some some weapons or weapon like things in here somewhere, right? There was something sharp or stabby or or otherwise problematic, right? Do mm. I remember that correctly? Not that I remember. Well, the veggie pygmies had stone weapons. Okay. There's all the glass that's in the chamber. Mm, okay. But like other than that, I don't think there was like anything weapon like in here. Oh yeah, Latchkey found a new weapon. Mm. By the way. Yeah, Latchkey has a flashy gem sword 
Rikashi. Yeah. You haven't seen that before. Yeah, that's like the fourth down the list of things I'm not asking about at the moment. Also, I have a dog. Yeah, I noticed that. His name's Bach. Okay. <laughs> My faith is a dog. Huh. Okay, I'm I'm trying to think about what else. If this guy's going to do this, I'm trying to think about what else we can transport underneath him while he's in the process of jumping. <laughs> like, so he lands on some spikes, basically? Is that the idea? Yeah, or, or something, yeah. Does does this thing move? The cube? Princess, can, can the princess change locations? Moving the location of the princess would require authority you do not have. Hmm. Princess, does the princess have any external weaponry? All weapons are stored in the armory. That's the first decent word I've heard since I got up here. Princess, we look at the armory? princess, where is the armory? I don't think the armory is in the princess. The armory may be accessed from... Sorry, I'm just making sure... That give these rooms very specific names, but they're slightly obtuse. So I want to make sure that I use the right name here. Specific, but slightly obtuse. That doesn't sound like Kelly at all. (laughs) That's not entirely our brand. (laughs) The armory may be accessed from the holding cells. Whoa. Whoa. Hmm. Let's go. Does the party want to go to the holding cells? Yes. Sure. Yeah. Okay. Okay, uh, we established that going through the the northern door or the 12 o'clock door of this room takes you directly to the holding cells. So uh, you do that, then for Akashi's benefit, uh, you know, the, the door is a circular metal aperture that opens like an iris, um, leads to a short hall, another one opens, and then there's another room beyond there. Uh, it's pretty obvious to Akashi that the uh, the space doesn't work out. The room that she was in before was roughly about as big as this cube is. So there shouldn't be space for this other room on the other side of this door. Mm. So, you know, that's weird. Mm. Uh, what's in the holding cell space at the moment? So in the holding cells at the moment, because there's less than there were before, are a Atrai, which is like a giant flightless parrot on big stilt legs um, surrounded by three chul, which are lobster monsters with tentacle faces that are menacing it. That's in one cell. There is a big tank of water uh, with um, something like an aquatic mind flayer uh, whose base ends in tentacles rather than legs um, floating in it. There is a grill. Rikashi knows what a grill is. And those are the things that are lizard. Each of those things are in three different of the cells. And there is that uh, sort of table with a control panel for the room itself in the center of the room. And this whole space is filled with like rotting cabbage at this point? Uh, yeah. Oh, and then there's a ton of like rotting vegetable matter. Uh, yes. Whatever of the, the, the gooified vegetable stuff. Um, and possibly memories. Memories might have died here too. Um, so wait, princess, or maybe I am. Uh, how do we access the armory from here? I thought we've been through all the doors. I am goes over to the control panel and presses a few buttons. A um, essentially a section of the ceiling comes down and creates a set of stairs up into the overhead area. I noted this. I'm not trying to say that you should have realized this. I'm just sort of I'm letting you know that I did note when you first entered this room, the ceiling in here is much lower than in the other spaces. Mm. So there's basically there's the same amount of overall space in this section of the cube as all the other spaces. But because the ceiling is so much lower, there's space for another room above it, sort of a sub room. Hmm. Oh, very clever. If you go up the stairs, I didn't bother to make a space for this on the map because it's so it's small and it's doesn't have anything in it other than stuff. Um, it's basically just like a storage closet, uh, like a, a bit large storage closet, but a storage closet. And in the storage closet are 
two of those silver suits that the strange figures were wearing They're hung up on hooks. They have the golden sort of ball helmets that are separate from them. Uh, so there's two of those. There's hooks for more than that, but there just happen to be two here. Um, there's a couple of objects that look sort of like crossbows, except that they don't have bows uh, to them. They're, they're like the, the structure of a crossbow, which is basically like a, a rifle stock and a long stock. They have triggers and shoulder straps. And then there is a rack with several um, things that look sort of like the handles of swords, but no crossbar and no sword. Rikashi, mm -hmm. you've seen one of these before. Last Egg Day, hmm. when you were at the Gold Dragon with Warren Argle Bargle, that display from various items from the Silvery Karn in the Golden Dragon had, among other things, something that was labeled the Chartreuse Torch and looked like these hilts with no blade. Hmm. Thank God it's a lightsaber. I'm going to pick one of those up. <laughs> mm -hmm. It's going to be green. What, what does it have details? Yeah, it has several. So looking at it, um, you can see that there are several uh, like rings around the hilt. They're, uh, they're all yellowish. And I'm assuming that Rikashi is being careful here. Yes. So, I will say that she thinks she could probably turn those rings. They look like they are designed to maybe to maybe spin. So there's something that perhaps could be affected by turning the rings on it. I'm not assuming that she's going to do that. I'm just letting you know that it seems like it's possible. Um, she is going to do that. She's just going to do it okay. carefully. <laughs> so one end of so the the these they are a short rod like item. I'm intentionally not just describing them as a rod because that could be confusing. They're a short rod-like item. Um, one end of the rod is just flat, like the pummel of a sword, but the other end has like an aperture in it. Um, uh, yeah, so they're, they're different. There's, there's a distinction between end one and end two of the handle. Yeah, so she's going to sort of hold it out like perpendicular. Mm -hmm. So like... As if anything might come out of either end and then carefully start fiddling with uh, wheels. So she fiddles with a couple of the wheels and some of them turn and don't appear to do anything. But once she turns the one that is the furthest down towards the base of the handle, a gout of yellow green fire shoots out of the sort of aperture end of the handle, um, forming like a line um, about three feet long. Uh, it just kind of holds of this very bright colored somewhere between like fire and a lightning bolt, you know, somewhere on the line there between the, what we're talking about. It's not quite exactly like conventional flame. Um, it looks a little bit like the way a lightning bolt looks in the sky for that instant. You can see it. Well, shit. Um, if she continues to fiddle with the wheel, she can see that she can adjust the structure of the gout. Um, the length is changeable. Its width doesn't vary a lot, but it can be varied somewhat. Um, so the, the other wheels seem to control kind of like exactly what comes out the end. Hmm. Is it constant or is it sort of not exactly flickering, but is there motion to it like like a flame would have. Yeah, there is some motion to it. Um, it is not 100% constant. You can see that it is like a, it is a thing that is cycling and being replenished in some sense, not just a completely static, constant thing. It emits uh, a significant noise and there is a ozone smell to it as well, which is a, definitely a smell that would be familiar to some of the more arcanely inclined uh, characters. Great. Uh, I turn it off, grab the other one, and tuck them both into my belt. Okay. Um, I suppose I'll just grab... How many of those crossbow things are there? There were two. There were two. I'll grab one of those, 
Yeah, I'm taking the other one, actually. Oh, good. Oh. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and the other things in here were those uh, those two suits. There's space for a lot more. It looks like there used to be more things here, and they were removed at some point. I mean, there's it, it is mm-hmm. not... The cupboard is not full. Princess, these um, suits with the golden orb things that are silver... Uh, I've never seen anything like them. What what do they do? What are they used for? The peregrination suits protect members of the Chimera Project when they are in hazardous environments. There's no way that's a word. <laughs> oh, it is, my friend. Peregrination suits. <laughs> that was an in-character statement. <laughs> no, no, fair, fair. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> peregrination suit. So, um... Dangerous environments means things like, like what exactly? Environments that would be hazardous to living things. The space between the stars. Attacking foes? Perhaps. Hmm. Could, I, could I go into a volcano with one of these? I do not have that information, but it could be possible. Hmm. All right. I am still very confused as to what the fuck is going on in here. So are these suits, these suits are not like armor. Like, could I roll one up and put one in my bag or. Uh, So they are like cloth in terms of um, how they feel. Okay. They're like a crinkly cloth. And so you could, uh, they're, they're hefty. Um, They're like big, thick, bulky cloth, but they're still cloth. So they could be balled up in that sense, right? They don't. They don't take up space like armor does where it's they're fixed. And so um, except for the helmet, right? Except for the helmet. The helmet is fixed. Um, And the boots have like soles. Those don't bend. Uh, Let's see. Um, So you're examining the suit. Other details. Um, The treads on the boots have the Chimera Project logo in them. Hmm. Of course they do. Princess, is there... Where is the peregrination suit that is sized for Balmo? What? I do not have that information. You may want to visit the priest. Oh, I will, princess. I will. (laughs) We forgot to tell you, Rikashi. Balmo is part of the Chimera Project, apparently. What? Yeah. He doesn't know either, but... um, Possibly not yet. But yeah. (laughs) So you have a lot of notes and information. You may want to like sit down and and share um, and sort of go over. There's all the materials that you stole from the uh, Skelet Brotherhood at one point. You never really sifted through all of those. Um, there's stuff that you've learned from inside the cube, like the full list of the members of the Chimera Project. There's the map that Rikashi has. If you want to have a scene just sort of like comparing notes rather than going through each point in character, which is entertaining, but maybe not infinitely productive. Right. We could have sort of a scene of like, and this is where we go through the information we've collected mm-hmm. and see if we can draw any conclusions. Yeah. Let's maybe retire to the living quarters. Well, mm-hmm. actually, no, we've, we've got some, some pressing issues. Back to Callista's room. I think we're okay. Uh, the um, the shaking has stopped, by the way. Oh. There were maybe a total of 10 of those bump, bump, bumps. But after a while, they didn't happen anymore. Oh. We can assume that they're planning something and going to cause us some grief, but not in the immediate, immediate future. We could drop another monster on them. <laughs> we do have that power. We could just keep dropping monsters. There's, there's nothing to stop us from dropping all the monsters. There isn't? It was a pain to get the monster onto the platform. But the more we practice, the better we'll get at it. I wonder if I am can facilitate that. <laughs> <laughs> no one disagreed with me. So we're going to retreat to Callista's quarters? I mean, that is where there's a couch, I believe. It's the most comfortable. I'm just kind of imagining a montage now that's going between like the group all sitting together and having like an intense discussion. It is first with like various monsters dropping down and attacking (laughs) (laughs) people underneath as they, you know, fend them off. And then occasionally like I am fleeing to the, you know, teleportation (laughs) by like a lumbering Hulk creature. 
Look, we 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 De- Demirthus had a hard time. I don't want to give her the job of going down and using that machine <laughs> repeatedly. Oh no, no, not not Demirtha. I was thinking I am. I mean, really, isn't this what the Chimera project was created for, right? We'd come up with better and better monsters that could deal with the problem that we're trying to throw it at, right? Eventually we'd come up with the perfect monster. I thought we established that only the bio life forms could use the meat making machine. No, Latchkey used it once. Oh no, that's right. Okay. All right, let's come back to that. Okay, so now I've moved the party to Callista's quarters. So we're down in that section of the map if you want to mm-hmm. follow along. So uh, Vin, in order to get there, Rikashi and the party have to go through the door at the north of the room, the, the uh, holding cells room, uh, into an especially, and even the sort of maximally sized open, brightly lit room uh, with the uh, three three large crystal containers that together form the reactor where there are these energy squids basically that are getting one one tank is full of white energy squids one tank is full of black energy squids they get mixed together in the middle and make some kind of a controlled explosion so that's happening when she walks past it uh, also in that room is the elevator and you ride the elevator up to get into close to quarters and close to quarters are like a kind of nice apartment uh, with tables and chairs and couches and relatively conventional human things, except there's, you know, still that white sparse background to everything. Yeah, so I assume there's sort of a montage of just Rakashi going, what the fuck, every several seconds? Mm-hmm. Um, and then it's explaining, oh yeah, that thing. So, so just to kind of try to quickly cover the stuff that we would cover from our side, um, there was getting in here. There was finding out that we know all these members of uh, of the Chimera Project, including that the first thing that we heard was Ordention. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's actually the part where Akashi is going to stop you. Like, probably most of the other information she'll take in with just a sort of general what the fuckedness. Mm-hmm. But, sorry, this this thing thinks that one of you is Ordention. Uh, us, specifically. Why? Uh, we suspect that a component of our personality comes from an artifact that Ordention once possessed and used as its access point to this place. And specifically, I mean, you have a direct suspicion that it's the pink gem. Yeah. And if you note that, Rikashi, you do know that Org had a magical glowing quill that was pink. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. Yeah, we, we saw, saw that, that on screen. screen. Yeah. Uh, so I'm just making sure to highlight that information that you have. Yeah. yeah. <sighs> okay. So so with that, we established that uh, that org as well as the other one, whose name I can't remember. Zarian Alphart. Zarian Alphart, yes. The reason I'm on this stupid island. Uh, that they are both listed as members of the Chimera Project. We established that we can make what seems to be an arbitrary number of hybrid super monsters uh, using a machine that kind of makes them out of spare parts and meat. Um, Let's see, what else did we establish? We established that Callista kept a diary here that seemed to go for what, like 40 years or some crazy amount of time. It, it, it's a very long time. We haven't really figured out what a cycle is yet, but it's, it's a very long time. And that everyone in the Chimera project was amnesiac or claimed to be in, in some way. And that they all, as far as we know, belong to at different points in history. Uh. Yeah. If you want to go over that list here, I'll drop it in the Slack again. The list of members of the, uh, of the Chimera project. And so based on the list, there's, there's certain things that certainly strongly suggest that there might be a time component to this. Number one, there's at least some people here who are probably best thought of as historical characters, I guess, from our perspective, like, if I remember the episode intro correctly, uh, Baron Lum mm-hmm. like disappeared and hasn't been seen for a long ass time. Let's go through it. If we go through it point by point, that might help to, to establish some things. Yeah. So we know okay. who Callista of Nyrond is without any particular ambiguity. Yep. And we've seen, like, it's, it's pretty thoroughly confirmed at this point. We've seen her picture. We've heard her voice. The party knows who that person is. And she's contemporary. She's been missing for a few years at this point in the game. And, and her record suggests that she has been here for a longer period of time than she's supposed to have been missing. Dramatically longer. 
Yes. Or potentially is even supposed to have been alive. Yeah, it would be pushing the total length of her life. Yes. Similar timeline for Orgnenshin and Zarian Albhart. They've also been missing for, at this point, maybe a little bit longer, more like several years than a few. So not exactly the same amount of time, but like their contemporary figures, you know, people who are alive right now knew them well, witness Rikashi, right? Mm. You know, or at least think you know who Father Balmo is. Uh, And if that theory is correct, then that theoretically describes some future state of Balmo as he's not... Because he's currently only a brother and not a father. That is fair. And only in possession of one of the artifacts of St. Wenta. Yes. Currently. Are there fathers in the Order of St. Wenta? Just one. Hmm. Just one? Well, wh- whoever, would, whoever would be in charge of the Order would be father or mother. Mm. Or maybe some other agender designation, if there is an agender designation in that society. So there can be. There can be, yes. Mm. Okay. Other obvious names on the list that you're just going to know without even needing to roll it. Morton Kanan was, maybe still is, the greatest uh, wizard of the Flaneus, uh, leader of the Circle of Eight. Hasn't been seen for a little over a decade at this point, but again, a relatively contemporary figure. But then we get into some funnier stuff. Zagig Wygrain was the Lord Mayor of Greyhawk for a very long time, but he hasn't been seen anywhere in over a century at this point. Mm. Um, He disappeared long ago, still in the middle of his term. It took them a long time actually to replace him as mayor because they were worried that he was just going to pop up again and want to go back to being the mayor. You said how long ago? Uh, Over a century. Okay. So all of these people so far have disappeared specifically. Yes. Disappeared or not been accounted for. Mm Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah. Like, like my two idiots took off. Do you consider org to have disappeared? Yeah. Right. Like, but, but the point is like, they don't have a specific known ending. No one's dead. Right. I have recently disappeared. Yes. Uh, so what would happen if we just killed him now? That sounds like an in-character question. Yeah. That was, that was definitely stated out loud. No, no, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep. 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 No. Oh. Nobody <laughs> <laughs> else even needs to respond. But, That's perfect. <laughs> yeah, but ba- Balmo is is just sort of stroking his mutton chops in thought of of like the uh, the conundrum a while uh, before uh, yeah before before uh, Machi answers that. And who else from the list would we specifically recognize? Uh. It might not be for all of you, but definitely by putting your heads together, you can have this information without needing to roll. Merland, with a Y and a D, and Kyugtun are both members of the Citadel of Seven, who were Zagig Wygrain's adventuring company. So they are contemporaries of Zagig's. Mm-hmm. And they, like, you know, there are stories about them and the adventures they got on up to together. I'm not sure that it would be fair to describe them as like explicitly having disappeared, but they're, they're characters of, of legend who are like, so there are lots of stories about what they might've gotten up to rumors that they went off to, you know, to like live in the astral sea or something or do something else crazy that high level adventures do. So there's also no specific ending for those characters. They both don't have a story where they died in some really notable way Mm -hmm. and are no longer contemporaries in any way that anyone is familiar with. Uh, day to day. Right. Right. And they are old. Like, yeah. again, definitely haven't been heard from in a century or more. Uh, as you noted, Baron Lum is, is old AF. Like, uh, that's closer to four or 500 years ago. Um, also disappeared. Also disappeared mm-hmm. very explicitly. Uh, Arnd of Tadan is a religion check. Okay. <laughs> Here we go. He's in the abyss. <laughs> uh, it's not looking good, guys. Oh, God. <laughs> well, okay. 13. Not terrible. Just 13. It's yeah. not a natural one. Yeah. It's yeah. not a one. Yeah. There's like the slightest hint of familiarity, like, yeah, right? Like, uh... yeah, yeah. As, as we're looking over the, that list, Balmo says, oh, yeah, who is that? <laughs> hey, is um, 
Demirtha's with us, right? Yes. And when, oh, yeah. when Balmo says, oh, yeah, who is that? She, like, kind of clucks her tongue. <laughs> nice. And is like, Arnd of Tadan? Tadan. One of the greatest heroes of the faith of Rao? Yeah. Where are the invulnerable coat of Arnd? That one. First tiefling to serve as Grand Censor. Sounds awesome. Anyway, he's a he's a figure from the early early church of, of Rao, a hero of great renown. Sounds like a cool guy. Sort of like the the exemplar of like not all tieflings are evil mm. mm-hmm. in the Flaneus, right? The idea that tieflings are inherently evil definitely exists as a prejudice in the Flaneus, and that he's like the chief not all tieflings hashtag guy <laughs> that people bring up. Uh, that's that's the story. When did he? He would have been like even earlier than Baron Lum, like a little bit before Baron Lum. And what's his ending or lack there? That's an in-character in question to uh, to Mirtha. Yeah. He was taken up into the Astral Sea in the service of Rao. And that's what the, I mean, that's what I was taught in, uh, in school. Hmm. So disappeared. Disappeared. Almost been flipping through the book and says, yep, checks out. (laughs) (laughs) So more of a rhetorical question, but why are my two scumbags involved in all this? But actual question, you said that all these people correspond with a three dragon anti-card? So here, I want to get back to the question. Do I still have one of the decks? Yes. Okay. I'm going to break that out. Okay. I'm going to spread the whole thing out. Put the whole thing out. Okay, so bearing in mind that over half of it is dragon cards, which don't appear to be right. relevant to us at the moment. Um, so once those are sorted out, you have... Uh, Ooh, is there a big cork board in this room where we can uh, start laying out the, uh, <laughs> the case? It's Callista's room, so I would say yes. Does anybody have any string? Yeah, I feel like we can have a cork board, something like that. Excellent. There's definitely materials lying around. Is there red yarn? Something like that, sure. Okay. There's probably nothing that's exactly yarn because I've already established that um, all disposable, perishable materials are basically so old that they're dust. Mm -hmm. But there's cloth in the room that can be broken down (laughs) to thread. It was a mostly (laughs) facetious question. But but my whole thing is being overly serious about your facetious (laughs) question. Um, So there are 14 different mortal cards and there are two of each of those 14, so a total of 28 mortals, right? Mm-hmm. Um, the Basically, the, the Eastern and the Western, or sometimes referred to as the left-handed and the right-handed, yep. of each of the mortals. So you're, you're trying to check the cards, right? That's the idea? Yep. Yeah, so um, you have a random deck, right? And we established that mm-hmm. the different, different decks made in different places at different times are going to have different people on these cards. I'm going to say that... Now... Go, go ahead. I was just going to say... Because I know I'm being pedantic here, but like, so there were two total decks that we were involved. In. Yeah. One was used to play a game on the vessel. And that's when we initially mm-hmm. discovered the existence of the Chimera card. That's right. Mm-hmm. Another different one was taken by me and used to play Three Dragon Anti on the island after we had crashed mm-hmm. with, I think, Latchkey and Demirtha. Mm-hmm. Sounds right. Those both come from the ship. Yeah. So the first one was specifically. Um, uh, Brattlewaite's deck, I think, if I remember correctly. Um, the other one was just from one of the quarters. I we didn't. I think it was from the, maybe a crew member or something. We didn't establish where it came from. But did one or both of them have the image of Callista as the princess? Right. So that the image of Callista as the princess was from the deck you were playing on the sh- with on the ship. Mm-hmm. That one also had a chimera. It also had a chimera. Mm-hmm. Does this other one have a chimera? Yes. Yes, okay. they both have chimeras and they're different. We compared them earlier. And from what I recall, Demirtha agrees that the chimera card's a thing. Yes. Like to her, that's really normal. Yep. So spreading these out, what do we get? Spreading them out, what do you get? Um, I'm not going to go through like all the ones that don't match because right. that would require me to pull out a whole bunch of NPCs and it would be a lot of work for very little payoff. Oh but, yeah, forget about um, that. Yeah, so like a lot of them don't match, right? Not a... But uh, it is super common, like, and, and just from having played the game before, the Archmage is almost always Mordenkainen, 
This that's just the era you mm-hmm. live in. Morton Kanan's been that's just normal. the most famous mage living in the Flanais for a long time. And he still mm-hmm. is, even though he hasn't been seen in about it, 10 years. So like it's unusual to encounter a deck made in the last 40 years that doesn't have Morton Kane as the Archmage. Um, there aren't a lot of people who get to be the Archmage. Right. Mm-hmm. right. Uh, similarly, almost universal that the Sorcerer is going to be Zaggy. In fact, I'm going to say Rikashi has this information because Rikashi is the person with the most experience in the city of Greyhawk. Zagig once famously threw a fit when someone tried to make him the Archmage in a deck when he was alive and and Lord Mayor, Mm -hmm. uh, tried to make him the Archmage in a deck of three dragon anti-cards. He was very insistent that he ought to be the Sorcerer and not the Archmage. So he's just almost always listed as the Sorcerer. Um, especially any deck that was made in Greyhawk. It's going to have him as the sorcerer. It's sort of a matter of civic pride. Mm-hmm. Um, other ones. Uh, we established that having Callista as the princess is kind of a new and novel thing. This deck doesn't have Callista as the princess. Um, I'm going to say it's just not a, because it's, it's from the, the ship, it's not a Greyhawk deck, so it's not going to have Org and Enchin in as, as the thief. It's some other guy as the thief. And. Uh, Lum the Mad, not Baron Lum, happens to be the emperor in this deck, and that's probably not un- unheard of. It's you know there are many different options for the emperor, and Lum is the one that conveniently uh, offends no one because he doesn't have any political following anymore. Um, mm. Do these do they list names or just recognizable by iconography? That would depend on the deck. In this particular one? In this particular one? Uh, yeah, in this particular one, it's labeled. Because I okay. said it says Lum the Mad. So in this particular one, it's labeled. Mm. But that's, that would be vary from deck to deck. Are are there decks that would have Ordention as the thief? Definitely decks made in the city of Greyhawk since he left. Mm. That makes sense. Okay. Kind of an Al Capone thing. Yes, exactly <laughs> like an Al Capone thing. Um, it would be common to see him as the thief. And there is not a Balmo in this deck. Definitely not a ball in this deck. Okay. Somebody else is the priest. But they do all have names. Yes. So we can see if someone is a Stephen the Rock, say, or a Merlin. Uh, yeah, let's see. Do I think that this is going to be a Stephen the Rock? Sure, yeah. It, it happens that the fool in this deck is Stephen the Rock. And he's a Can we smell guy when he's cooking? A, <laughs> he's a, a guy in a totally conventional jester outfit. You know, with the dangly bell thing hat, you know, Um, he's kind of beefy for the role. Like if you think of the generic conventional medieval jester, they're usually kind of spindly. And and he's like, what if a meathead was a jester instead, basically? Mm -hmm. Um, So the rock. (laughs) (laughs) I was going to go for, does he always say the character? I just want to say this is not me intentionally. I'm not trying to reference the rock here. No, but Uh, he has been face cast officially. No, yeah, basically. Um, Somebody could maybe know who this guy is. I think that, honestly, I got to say, I think Sarsimian is the best candidate to know who Stephen the Rock is. So we'll wait until Jeff gets back to cover that. But the point is, yes, here here is an example of Stephen the Rock as the fool in a a three dragon anti deck. Is there anyone else on this list that's not, uh, like, we haven't mentioned or that we wouldn't really know who they were, the names, I mean. We didn't talk about Yolande mm-hmm. or Felbert or Agwareth. Yeah. Let me look at it. Okay, so definitely, you'll, so this deck also has Yolande of Selene as the queen. Hmm. And she's an elf. I mean, it's very visible in the, from the picture that she's an elf. Mm-hmm. She's a striking elven woman in a fancy uh, dress, notably tall. At least the picture makes her look tall. Uh, and she's an elf, so you would expect that. Uh, Felbert and Agoreth are the other possibilities. Felbert, let's see. What do I think? Mm, well, so Worm Servant is a hard card to cast because it's not like there are a lot of adventurers. There are a lot of mm-hmm. fools. Worm Servant is a very specific sort of idea. Someone who is like the non-dragon assistant to a dragon. Hmm. So this deck does happen to have Felbert of Rel Juros. He's a uh, a red dragonborn in like 
the robes of some sort of official. And if someone, anybody who wants to make a history check, we can see if you know anything about Filbert of Real Juros. I'll do that. I got a pretty good history. Okay. I have history. <laughs> uh, oh, I guess I do too. Ooh. I got an 11. Oh, I got the natural one this time. Oh, yeah. the natural one! Oh, oh it turns out that okay. I'm Felbert of Real Juros. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Natural one. All right, all right. Let's do it, Hold on. I'll, I'll bail you guys out. Uh, no, I won't. <laughs> uh, 15. I got a 20 total. Not a okay. natural 20. Not a, just a 20-20. Just a okay. Uh, so who was the highest there? 20 and Casey. everybody beat 20? No. Okay. Mm, the 20, Casey, is good enough to recognize that Rel Juros is one of the cities of old Arcosia that doesn't exist anymore. Okay. And our old Arcosia is the dragon, the draconic empire that existed in the far eastern section that's now old Aerdy, the, the kind of region of the Aerdy heartland of the Flaneus. Hmm. So back when dragons ruled that section, presumably someone would be of Rel Juros. The city doesn't exist anymore, so they're not making people of Rel Juros anymore. Mm-hmm. So old is the point, even yeah. older than Baron Lum and Arnd of Tadan. Um, what are we going to do with your one, Josh? What are we going to do with your one? Okay. <laughs> my, um, oh, okay. You, you have an idea? <laughs> my, my offhand thought was that... Uh, Somebody has like horribly reinvented him, like in a more modern context, kind of like, you know, the 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 fate version. Well, you know him from trashy novels. <laughs> yeah, like ba- basically the thing where they've taken a historical character and made an anime girl out of them. So. <laughs> that was my pitch, but if you have something I, that's better, a good pitch. Yeah, that's a, that's a good. I, I, I enjoy that angle. Okay, yeah. Um, I think I think that that we are learning something new about. Ashlar here. <laughs> he has a, a, a love of like trashy noir thriller historical novels. Um, there's a whole series that's set in old Arcosia. Um, and Rel Juro, uh, and uh, and Felbert of Rel Juros is like one. It's like, um, ooh, ooh. He's like, ah, uh, what's his name? What's his name? What's his name? Um, Clear and present danger. Jack Ryan. Uh, Jack Ryan. Jack Ryan. Yeah, he's like the Jack Ryan of old Arcosia <laughs> in this novel series. <laughs> oh my god, this is totally something that Ash would would definitely love. <laughs> Ash definitely has traded way more expensive things for trashy romance novels that come across his shop. Oh, he's got he's got a collection of like first editions. Like, <laughs> I feel like it's uh, I feel like it's one of those things where the writer only knew a couple of actual names from that part of the world and was like, okay, well, there's somebody else with that name. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> you know, like Peter Rasputin. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, if nothing else, that gives you a hint about the timeline, mm. right? So we've got. A collection of people from multiple times, some contemporary, some extremely ancient, some uh, somewhere in between. There didn't seem to be necessarily like one or two specific times. It sort of seems to be a spectrum. There is at most, I guess, one or two that are from the future. Because there's only one. There's Bomo, whatever's going on there. And then one other name that we haven't accounted for. That's again assuming that this Balmo is our Balmo rather than some other. Well, I'm just saying, like everybody else has been ruled out. I think it's yeah. fair to say everybody else. And you have a lot of historical figures here. Yeah, mm-hmm. Everybody on this list, again, except for those two names that we can't account for, is famous. No, right. no, Zarian's not famous. That is true. Zarian is not famous. Oh, that's interesting. And Org, like Org, is locally well known, but. I don't know that I'd say that anyone would know his name in a hundred years. Right. I, I, I mean, I'm, I'm saying like they're known to us. So famous is is a relative here, but I guess what I mean is every one of the everyone except Zarian then on this list was some form of public figure. Like Org is not necessarily going to go down in like the history books, but like contemporary politics, he ran the yeah. um, the the thieves guild or whatever. So like he's a person that would be covered by the you know by the news. He's a person that's part of the rumor mill. He's a person who is notable in some way. Mm. And that seems to apply again to almost everyone here, except for Zarian. 
and maybe or maybe not the two names that we can't pass. Yes. And I was going to say, consulting with Demirtha, she can probably rule out that there is some other historical father Balmo, or that she w- oh. she probably doesn't know. Yeah, does she recognize Father Balmo? Definitely not. Okay. Okay. But we did establish that Balmo is not like an unusual half Right. No, I think we specifically said it was a pretty common half mm. name. Okay, well... Okay. So... <laughs> We figured that out. Um, On the big picture, what else did we not cover about what we've learned in here? Uh, Oh, the members of the Chimera went on excursions to different places around other worlds, other planes, possibly, and they collected some things. They went to something that Obliviax referred to as a sallow star. Oh, yeah. We should probably mention Obliviax. That was a big thing. (laughs) Yeah. Um. I think for almost all of the other information you you relay, it's just like nodding and cursing. Yep. Uh-huh. Um, and then when you get to the ability X part, she's like, you did, you did. Okay, whatever. And then moving on. I did tell them that his name was Obliviax. Thank you. <laughs> we got a very agreeable sword out of the deal, so. Uh-huh. Which we wouldn't have gotten had we not let him out. Mm-hmm. And killed him. So on, on, on that angle, then, is there anything else that Rikashi knows that we should know? I mean, you knew that we were in the abyss. Yeah. Um, other salient points. Uh, I mean, there's some stuff about island geography and terrible places not to go. We are not supposed to give the obelisk to the hippogriff. That is a sentence I would not have expected to ever say. But I think, I think we've got that one. Okay. Um. Yeah, I mean, beyond that, like, there's some pirates. There's, you know, various forms of monsters and terrible things that I don't think we have anything to do with. Mm-hmm. Um, so here's a question. Are all those other pads up there pads for moving from one place to another place? It seems possible. They're for moving us and only us to other stations. It seems not for they don't seem to be for moving the island. No. OK. That I'm, a, that I'm aware. So we could just use one of those and not be here. Yeah. Maybe. Oh, there's also a tunnel with lightning. There's a Ash. You 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 had a better idea of what that was. Yeah. Remind, remind me what we determined about that. There's a train station. So, yeah, this was during the explorations uh, in the middle of last game. Uh at the 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 room that you go to when you go down the stairs in the rear room in the reactor chamber room instead of going up the elevator is I mean it's a subway station that's what it looks like on the inside there's like a you know kind of a cavernous space and then at one far wall there's an opening into basically a tube with a long metal rail that crackles with lightning uh, in it. And there's a map on the wall that uh, seems to suggest the different points on some sort of a rail system. Okay, that makes less sense than the rest of the sense of this made. Let me, hold on, tangent. Let me see if I understand how to do this. Princess, where is the thief? That's it this week for the Chimera. Our theme music is Hoof, Heart, and Hiss by Matt Weber. You can find a link to more of Matt's work and any other music used in this episode in the show notes. You can also find us online at thechimera.space or on Twitter and Facebook at ChimeraPod. If you enjoy the show, please consider leaving us a rating and review on Apple Podcasts or just telling your friends. Join us back here in two weeks for the next episode, and thanks for listening.
So then yeah. my 26 should have been a 29. Damn. Okay. I guess we all know about this for some reason. <laughs> Maybe we'll know why once we know him. House Black Lanterns? House Black Lanterns, yeah. Yeah, House Black Lanterns, yeah. Oh, yeah. That's where I got my last Black Lantern. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, we gotta we gotta get that clip into the show. Right? <laughs>